All right, welcome back. Um, I am not Will Roberts, the scheduled um, chair and discussant of this panel. Uh, Will has unfortunately come down with COVID. Um, and so in addition to keeping us all from meeting in person, the virus is keeping this panel from its much more thematically appropriate and knowledgeable potential discussant. Um, I am jumping in on a last minute basis to do what I can. Um, though, as uh, Guillaume has heard me say many times, I don't understand the Greeks and my ability to say anything uh, meaningful about them is very limited. Uh, this panel is on the history of constitutional thought and ideas. And we are joined this afternoon by uh, Teresa Bejan, who is Associate Professor of Political Theory in the Department of Politics and International Relations and a fellow of Oriel College at Oxford and is in the final stages of her tenure uh, as the 2021 visiting Fulbright Chair in Constitutional and Political Theory at the Research Group on Constitutional Studies at McGill. Guillaume Bajiaris is Assistant Professor of Political Science at the University of West Alabama um, and is also uh, one of the, it is also the first research group on constitutional studies student fellowship alumnus to appear on the program. There will be several more on the program over the next couple of days and was, I believe, the first RGCS student fellowship alumnus um, to become a tenure track assistant professor. Uh, and Daniel Lee, whom we've wanted to get out at RGCS in one capacity or another for a long time, but haven't had the occasion to, so I've got no RGCS connection to draw in his introduction, is Associate Professor of Political Science and Director of Graduate Studies in Political Science of, at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, and that is the order in which we will proceed. Teresa. Right. Uh, well, thank you, Jacob, um, for the uh, introduction and also for the invitation. And I will say I am speaking to you all from from the UK now. I unfortunately had to leave Montreal a bit early, but I'm um, very sad to be coming to the end of my tenure. It's been it's been an incredible experience. Um, so my paper today is called Briefly Leveling. And for those of you who looked, you would not have found it in the Dropbox because it's an unfinished <laughs> half of a chapter of my current book project. And so I'm just in my time now, I'm just going to speak briefly about the project and where this chapter fits before I drill down into the specifics of the argument I wanna make. So, um, so the first thing to say is that it's half of a chapter of a book that's entitled First Among Equals, which is uh, offering a historically and theoretically informed account of what we might describe as equality before egalitarianism. So the question I'm interested in is how equality became an effectual premise of political arts of political argument. And in the book, I trace that development, sort of that, that movement towards effect effectiveness to 17th century England, and in particular to a ragtag groups, a, a group of uh, London radicals known to their opponents and to us today as the levelers. So in identifying the levelers as kind of key quote unquote early egalitarians, I'm hardly unique. Um, Levelers are extolled on the American and libertarian right, on the British left, and uh, you know most recently by uh, Jeremy Corbyn, who identified the leveler leader uh, John Lilburn as his most admired political figure, um, as egalitarians of on the lettre, as really important figures in the history of equality. But for our purposes, it's it's more interesting also just to see how many um, contemporary political theorists point to the levelers and look to them for historical inspiration. So Jeremy Waldron points to them as important predecessors to John Locke um, in their egalitarian political theory, what he describes as their egalitarian political theory. But uh, most importantly, perhaps Elizabeth Anderson uh, in her 2017 book, Private Government, points to the levelers and to Lilburn in particular as relational egalitarians of all the um, so what, uh, what 
theorists like Waldron and, and Anderson point to in particular are these really um, wonderfully clear, it seems, statements by leveler leaders and sympathizers like Colonel Rainborough at the 1647 Putney debates of the premise of natural equality, i.e. The, the idea that human beings are somehow equal by nature. So uh, Rainborough's famous quote is, really, I think that the poorest tea that is in England hath a life to live is the greatest tea. And therefore, truly, sir, I think it's clear that every man that is to live under a government ought first by his own consent to put himself under that government. And you know, if you read any egalitarian political theory, um, you'll see that even the most analytic of political philosophers will kind of help themselves to that rainbow quote when they want to give some sort of historical texture to the claims they're making. Um, but for Anderson in particular, she's particular she points to John Lilburn's 1646 postscript containing a general proposition, and I quote. God, the absolute sovereign Lord and King of all things in heaven and earth, gave man, his mere creature, the sovereignty under himself over all the rest of his creatures, and thereby created him after his own image. And then this is the key Lilburn point. Thus, every particular individual man and woman that ever breathed into the world since, who are and were by nature all equal and alike in power, dignity, authority, and majesty, none of them having by nature any authority, dominion, or magisterial power, one over or above another. And so in the Rainbow quote, we see a, a kind of connection between our shared humanity and the need for every man, every he, to consent to civil government. But in Lilburn, we get something even more radical. It's an explicit inclusion of women in a way that evidently precludes sexist subjection. So according to Lilburn, neither men nor women can claim any power over others, but merely by institution or donation, that is to say by mutual agreement or consent. That's what Lilburn says. Anyway, so uh, egalitarian theorists like Anderson and Waldron want to want to draw a kind of close and tidy connection between these stated premises uh, in leveler theory to the conclusions of their political arguments, in particular, the claims that they make in the 1647 Putney debates um, in favor of, quote, equal representation and equal law. And in other places, although not, not at Putney, we also get the locution equal rights. Um, and so if what it meant to be an egalitarian was simply to have you know, the word equal in your premises and the word equal in your conclusions, well then, you know, great, we've proved that the levelers all are egalitarians. But the problem is um, that levelers are hardly unique uh, in subscribing to some form of equality as a premise and also to another form of equality as a conclusion of their political arguments. And so the bigger project in the book is simply to remind political theorists um, that the natural equality of human beings had been by the 17th century a legal and theological commonplace for over a millennium um, with roots in, in Roman law, which of course Dan uh, can, can, can walk us through and I'm sure he will. Um, so the premise, the presence of a premise that human beings are equal by nature in a political argument is not in itself sufficient to make that argument egalitarian. Um, and you know, I just say that uh, if, if that's all it took, then everyone at Putney, the levelers and their opponents were egalitarians. And clearly that can't be right because we want to sort of say, oh, well, the levelers are doing something egalitarian, their opponents, Cromwell, Ireton, et cetera, are not. But it's important um, for the project to just note that everybody at Putney is embracing equality. They agree that they want representation to be more equal. They just disagree about what equal representation entails. And so in the rest of the chapter, I want to argue that the levelers are important and their premise is distinctive, not because they subscribe to an idea of natural equality, but rather because they come up with a novel of idea of what I call natural parity. So whereas we might think of the claim to natural equality of human beings being primarily a claim to their indifference in God's eye as an under natural law, which is sort of how it comes in, especially in, in, in Roman sorry, in Christian uh, adaptations of the Roman law principle that omnes uh, aequales uh, sumus under, you know, uh, by the natural law, that the levelers really give us a sense of human beings not as aequales or equals by nature, but rather as pares. And so in English, uh, we might think of this as, uh, not, we're not only equal by nature, we're actually, we're peers by nature. And so the what gives weight to level of claims is this idea that every English man and woman by virtue of his birth as an English man or woman is entitled to a kind of privilege or sort of peer status. Um, 
so that's the argument in the chapter. What I want to focus on just in my remarks now is that if we want to understand what's distinctive, if we can all agree that the levelers are distinctive, well, then we really do need to drill down into the language of equality at the time. And so what I want to do is just walk us briefly through um, what I see as kind of the main um, the main uh, sort of ways of thinking about and invoking equality as a political principle in English political date in the early 1640s and, and, and previously um, to sort of set the stage for the leveler's intervention. Uh, so when we hear the claim that human beings are equal today, and um, I think Jeremy Waldron brings this out very well in his new book, uh, his, his more recent book, One Another's Equals, we tend to hear that, well, human beings are equal, therefore they are entitled to an equal distribution of rights. Or um, if we, you know, others might say, well, th they sort of occupy necessarily then a kind of equal status. And so what I want to really unpick in the book is that connection. I just, I think that's a connection that's forged, forged in the 17th century. It's not there previously. And to show this, I show that really, well, the primary uh, language of equality in, in early modern English, as it had been in, in medieval um, and post-classical Latin, was of equalitas as balance. So sort of the primary sense is equality is balance. And if we even look to what all of us know today as the, the equal sign, so you know two lines of parallel length put in the middle of a mathematical equation, well that's coined by a, an English mathematician in the 1550s, but even then the equal sign is an expression of the balancing of two sides of an equation that facial at least, facially at least are dissimilar. Right, so it's about balancing that which appears to be or is by nature not is dissimilar and even uh, unequal in a certain sense. So it's equalizing things that are unequal, and that I think is really important because if we look to, for instance, Charles the First's answers to the nineteen propositions issued by the Long Parliament, he's going to appeal to equality as a kind of constitutional principle of balance. So he praises the equal English constitution and its balance of lords uh lords crown and commons of course uh you know the long parliament disagrees that the english constitution is actually balanced at that point um but again the conflict is one about political equality but that's not understood as a matter of equal rights it's understood as a matter of constitutional balance and in the paper i contrast this kind of royalist version of the balanced constitution with republican versions um put forward by harrington or william sprigg uh, in the 1650s. And the Republican account of equality as balance is really about using institutions and particularly agrarian laws to balance the different parts of the, of the body politic. So again, the idea here is a political equality as something that's profoundly artificial or conventional. Equality is achieved by balancing that which is naturally unequal, the different parts of the body politic. Again, so we might see that as having that sort of early modern Republican argument as having deep roots in Greek political thought. If we look at Athenian isonomia, that again is an idea of balancing that which is naturally unequal. Or uh, Roman equalitas, if we look at um, Cicero or, or Livy, we get this sense again of equalitas as the balancing of the different parts of, of the body politic. Um, but I also wanna say uh, just, in terms of equality as balance, it's really also important to remember that the label given to the levelers and by which they're known today, levelers, is itself an appeal to this idea of equality as balance. So leveling, normally historians will say, well, the levelers are called levelers because they're um, being called after these 1607 protesters who leveled hedges in protesting against enclosures. That's true, but there is also this longer tradition of worries about leveling in English political thought. And um, my favorite example of this is this so-called uh, leveling giant episode in Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen, in which a giant with a huge set of scales is going to come to level, uh, level and uh, distribute all and equalize uh, to uh, women, fools, and boys. Um, and then Artigal, the Knight of Justice, whose name is Arthur plus equal, <laughs> right, comes to sort of set him straight on the true meaning of equality as balance. <laughs> 
So you've, they both agree it's equality is balanced. They just disagree about how the correct balance is to be achieved in the Commonwealth. And again, this is really important. And if we're sort of, you know, if you're keeping score, it's really interesting then that in 16, in the 16, in 1648, I think, um, an anonymous pamphleteer republishes Spencer's verse, verses as a quote, lively image of our time. And he equates the leveling giant with Cromwell and Artigal the Knight of Justice with Charles the first, right? So again, um, we the label applied to the levelers is them is itself an indication that there's a kind of longer longer tradition of thinking of equality as a political principle in play and it's not an individualist one and it's not connected to an idea of natural equality how am i doing for time jacob five minutes three minutes Four minutes. Okay. So in the remaining four minutes, uh, I want to say, well, the big difference, though, between sort of arguments about political equality as a constitutional principle in the 1640s, the big difference is, is that we are now in a world where natural equality is itself a religious and legal commonplace. So the question is, how do these arguments that we want that equality is a valuable constitutional principle become connected to this natural law idea that human beings are equal by nature. It's not as obvious as you would think is, is the short answer. Um, and so in the, in the chapter, I point to uh, two English authors, or it's not, sorry, two British authors in particular, part of my apologies to the Scots present. Um, so Samuel Rutherford and Henry Parker. Um, who are both sort of broadly associated uh, with the parliamentary and parliamentarian cause, although Rutherford is a Scottish Presbyterian, and so he's really sort of writing as a covenanter. Um, both Rutherford and Parker appeal to the principle of natural equality that human beings are equal by nature in order to deny the naturalness of monarchy. And they do this in wonderfully vivid ways, uh, which you know are, are are just wonderful to read in their own right. I'm not going to read them to you now, um, but again, uh, as Dan Lee has 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 written has focused on in his own work on popular sovereignty, the kind of connection between the natural equality principle and the popular sovereignty principle is again not maybe the straightforward one that modern egalitarians would want to tell about equal individual rights. Rather, natural equality as indifference is used as a kind of negative principle to sort of clear away any claims to natural political authority between human beings, right? So it's the fact that men are equal by nature that means that a god of equal justice would not have elevated one man over everyone else in order to rule them. You know, as Rutherford says, no, no man, no king was born with a diadem on his head, right? So we're all born naked, mewling, and, and you know, alone. Uh, <laughs> but, and this is the key point, Rutherford and Parker are also extremely clear that this is only a point about political power. And in this, they're absolutely in keeping with the kind of monarchomac tradition with cardinal, so Catholic and Protestant appeals to uh, natural equality in, in arguments for popular sovereignty. Um, this natural equality is not seen in, as in any way challenging or impugning the other forms of uh, what we would call inequality between human beings. So Rutherford's very clear, this has nothing to do with the power of parents over their children. It has nothing to do with the power of husbands over their wives. And it has nothing to do, very interestingly, with the, with the just rule of the wise over the foolish. And Rutherford actually links this directly to Plato, especially Plato's arguments in the laws, and the idea that even though we all sort of bear God's image, we are nevertheless all sort of minted out of different materials. Some men are, are as of gold, others as are of clay or iron. And so here I think it's a very clear expression of the idea that natural equality is nevertheless consistent with natural disparity. That is natural differences, hierarchically, or, uh, hierarch hierarchically ordered differences of value between individual human beings. Now in Parker, we don't get as radically straightforward a statement of that as we do in Rutherford, but we get this fascinating discussion, which I just think has not been given its due by historians of political thought, in which Parker actually begins his 1644 text, Use Populi, by comparing the marriage contract to the covenant between a prince and his people. So what Parker argues is, is although human beings are equal, he's emphatic, 
women and men are nevertheless created disparata. Women and men are disparate, even though they're equal. Nevertheless, the marriage contract, he says, creates a kind of parity out of disparity, right? So here again, we have the sense of artificial parity, a sort of artificial equalizing of status between those who are naturally unequal. And um, in the chapter, I link this to Anna Becker's recent book, Gendering the Renaissance Commonwealth, which I think is just fantastic. And when she recovers this Aristotelian tradition of thinking of marriage as a kind of egalitarian, I mean, as a kind of equalizing relationship and that the, in a, a tradition in which the language of parity is also important. Um, but so to, to leave my argument here, so you, know, you might say, well, now it's just a promissory note for the, the argument about the levelers. I don't have time now to make the argument about the levelers, but I just wanna make the point here that it's not enough as modern egalitarians want to say about the 17th century to say, oh, well, the point was to have a principle of natural equality. Clearly, the principle of natural equality was widely shared. What's distinctive about the leveler premise, as opposed especially to parliamentarians like Parker, is the rejection of natural disparity. There is no hierarchical ranking or ordering of the metals of which men and women are made, right? Now, um, that's the key point. That's the argument that I'm gonna make in, in, in the book at greater length. Of course, it doesn't therefore follow from this that men and women are going to be afforded equal political rights by the levelers, they are not. Nevertheless, it does, I think, explain what changes decisively in the 1640s with the language of natural equality and also why this change happened in England where the language of parity, so in Latin paritas, took on a very peculiar meaning in English within the context of the English common law and the status of peers as opposed to the status of commoners. So it's a wonderful, I think, sort of proof case of the um, importance of contingency in the history of political thought, contingencies of translation, of legal traditions, of, um, of, uh, uh, of social practices. And I'm really here excited about the practices of hat honor <laughs> um, and how those fed into leveler practices as well as their, as well their, as their theories. But for now, I just, uh, hopefully I've shown that the levelers are, are a bit more interesting than maybe modern egalitarians give them credit for. Thanks. Great, thank you. Guillaume. Thank you. Uh, so first, uh, let me begin by what I like to call the uh, manage your expectations part of my talk. Um, and so if you looked at the uh, program today, you will have seen all those great presenters and then me and you will have thought like, oh, one of those things is like the other and you will have been right, uh, in fact, um, and this is to say that I am uh, insecure and that my imposter syndrome is now fully formed into a doppelganger that is watching TV on my couch. Um, and also I uh, want to warn you that um, if uh, it were getting dangerously close to the hour where my cat starts thinking about dinner and if you hear the howling of a wounded beast, it's because uh, Mutab wants kibble. Uh, and so just trying to sort of like set the stage here for inevitable disruptions. Um, <clears throat> now, with this being said, um, thank you for having me over. It's great to see uh, all professors and friends. And uh, uh, today I was really enthused uh, to be part of this. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about this project because the paper in itself is sort of uh, it looks odd by itself because it's part of a diptych, which is, and the, this paper, this draft is the second part of a paper that's been published by PRQ last summer about um, immigrant obligations. And the point of the project is to reconcile on the one hand, the right of free movement, which I wholeheartedly buy into it. I uh, think we should have a moral commitment towards with identitarian moral claims, which have uh, in fact normative pull. And if you'll sort of like allow me to, uh, and the crito fits in this oddly. In fact, I think uh, that the presence of the crito obscures my normative argument. And those two papers are normative papers, which are framed in terms of the crito because I just like that framing and in a bit of strush and 
Straussian fashion, uh, I like to hide my own normative, normative positions behind classical texts. Um, and so the point of the original project is to say, like, one thing that I came to uh, in the first paper uh, is to argue that there is a relationship of justice between migrants and the communities that they leave. Uh, and the way that I put this in the original paper, and I hope that you'll uh, forgive me the arrogance of setting myself, but I write, so if we're born into societies that create us as much as we create them, and I take this from Stephen Macedo, and that those identities are intrinsic goods, and I take this from Will Kimlicka, then there exists a moral obligation that touches tangible goods, but also addresses the intangible goods that are created by those communities. And so the credo highlights that residents and their descendants are entitled to the continued survival of the communities, diversity, laws, and associations that are indispensable to the formation of their identities on top of the material needs that are identified by uh, Macedo. And so I'm taking for granted that we all know the context of the credo here, but I'm going to go over it anyways, just for the sake of setting the stage for uh, the argument in this paper, right? And so the credo takes place at a moment after Socrates' trial. Crito comes to jail. He says, I've arranged things, you can flee. Socrates doesn't want to flee. Uh, he's not going to, and in order to convince Crito that it's not the right thing to do to leave, he's going to anthropomorphize Athens' laws, right? And so the laws come in and they essentially say like, oh, yo, Socrates, like you're about to bounce at the 11th hour. It's not very cash money of you to do this, you know? And uh, there's a essentially... And Socrates agrees with them at the end. And Crito is also convinced by this argument. Um, and one thing that I think the Laws' argument highlights is that it it that the they have they make a tripartite argument, but I think that two parts of the argument uh, are relevant for us to think about migrant obligations to their constitutive communities. And in the paper, I call them. Uh, the argument from parentage and the argument from corruption. Uh, and shout out to Jeff Sigel at, at, for that uh, particular formulation. He that he uh, edited me when I wrote the first paper, and uh, and so that's sort of I credit where credits due. Uh, I'm not clever to have come up with that nice formulation by myself, but Jeffrey is, and so it's great to have uh, former RGCS members as co-editors to come up with. Uh, like nice branding like this. Um, and so the debt of parentage from Athens laws perspective, right, is that the laws contribute, the setting of your society contribute to the formation of your identity, right? And that this in identity, and today we still buy in, into this argument, right, that this identity is an intrinsic moral good that is unquantifiable, right? And this is something that is like relatively well accepted across the world, right? Even when immigrants leave their home countries and they move to other ones, right? We take the preservation of some form of that identity to be a right, right? That's why we have conversations about integration, assimilation, multiculturalism, right? My, when my grandparents came from Romania to Quebec in the 1950s, right? They flocked to their co ethnicists right, to borrow a phrase from Jacob's first book. And then, right, and there was a tiny community of Romanians, right, and it was understood to be their right to be together, to have some aspect of their culture survive, and so on and so forth, right? So identities are an intrinsic moral good, but the states from which we are from, and the communities within those states from which we are from, uh, contribute to this. And so it means that we have a moral relationship of obligation towards them, something that I call um, a, a right, a, a relationship of justice, right? Between us and the communities that we come from because of the importance of those identities, right? And what this means is that, and that leads into what I call the argument from corruption, uh, means that, and the laws say, right? If you leave, I can announce you to the other city states as a destroyer of the laws. You will be received badly because you're a destroyer of the laws, right? And then, and this is also a concept that we buy into to some degree today, right? We have special provisions for immigration or um, going across boundaries or uh, 
I frontiers right like uh, borders. I'm sorry, it's my Frenchness that came in this moment of stress. Uh, right for people who have criminal records and so on. So we also have a countries today, right, have some sort of this notion of like destroyers of the law, having their privileges restricted when they try to move across borders. And the law says you could be received as a destroyer of the law because you're not honoring the obligation that you have towards us because we help make you, you, all right? And what I argue, argue in the first paper is that this creates in fact a relationship of obligation and that this relationship of moral obligation has to be fulfilled by in a sense, making sure that the community that you leave can go on thriving and surviving even in your absence, all right? And so the second paper, uh, and I'm sorry for this long preamble, the second paper was birthed because of a reviewer comment on the first paper who said, okay, but what about authoritarian states? Because they too contribute to identity formation, right? To go back to the example of my Romanian grandparents, they specifically fled the Ceausescu regime, which was not a good time at all. And like, but the Romania that they fled contributed to making them who they were and that positions that makes it so that from the perspective of my argument, they can make that same claim about the relationship of justice existing. Now, this is problematic for us because we don't like to consider the idea that authoritarian states, right, states that are not bounded by constitutions, who are not bounded by things like those rules of the game, um, we normally look at them like oppressive moral failures and we treat people who leave them like as being a uh, de facto warranted in their escape, right? And so, and that the question that I was forced by this reviewer to consider and that I now think is actually quite interesting is that is there an obligation implied to authoritarian states, right? The, the de facto answer is that this is morally irrelevant, but I don't think it is. I think in fact, it's really morally relevant and I want to say why. Uh, first, because those states use claims of being destroyers of the laws to discredit the refugee claims of the people that flee them and to discredit those claims in the eyes of other would-be refuge states. And the other thing is that even in states, certain communities within liberal democratic states, right, are treated illiberally, right? We were talking earlier uh, about the example of native communities in Canada, or we think, or I live in Alabama half the year, right? And so one thing that comes to mind that's very vivid as an example is the treatment of African-American communities in Alabama, right? And so I think that thinking about this obligation to authoritarian states or or non-authoritarian states that treat certain communities illiberally can, um, I think, it can help us sort of like disentangle this moral puzzle, right? And so, and furthermore, it contributes to uh, some scholarship by like Demetra Casimis, uh, Rebecca Lemoine, uh, Janet Kirkpatrick, right? Who have done, and I'm following in their footstep in trying to sort of like make, uh, take this, uh, this these uh, normative, prescriptions from the Kraito into the way that we contemporary, that we think today about uh, migration theory. <clears throat> and so what I want to say in the second paper is that in fact, insofar as certain states contribute to identity formation, yes, there is an, a relationship of justice there, a relationship of obligation, but inspired by the Kraito, we can think of two examples, two situations that discount or at the very least lessen uh, the moral obligation that exists between uh, people in illiberal, non-democratic, authoritarian states and their states, even if they contribute uh, to identity formation, all right? Um, and so I'm going back to this because it's the identitarian claims that are behind all of this, right? And so in this paper, I developed two exceptions that color or mitigate this relationship of obligation. The first one is the exception from slavery. And I take this from the credo because the laws get confused at some point and they go interchangeably between talking to Socrates as their thrall or talking to Socrates as if he were their children. And being someone's child and being someone's indentured servant is not at all the same relationship. Uh, I've never been someone's indentured servant, but I've been someone's child. And I like to imagine that, it's, that those are very different experiences.
uh, despite the fact that my mother is Romanian and that the East Europeans have a tyrannical element to like family leadership, um, which I think overall is good. But uh, and so the laws get mixed up here. And the one exception I think that comes from this is that we have to consider right that you have a relationship to, of obligation to the state unless right you are a member of a group but in order to have that you also have to be a member of the group that enjoys bodily and psychological protections within the state if you're not then the relationship of justice is medicated i don't know if it's nullified i haven't thought this through yet uh, the paper just came back from review and i have all of these uh, the flaws in it are very vivid right now uh, they're very close to me, so this is very much still a work in progress. And the other exception that I want to make to this is the exception from subjection, right? Meaning that even if the state that you're in is an illiberal, uh, authoritarian, undemocratic state, then you have to have to be part of a group that enjoys some group rights in terms of representation. Uh, you have to have some manner of political voice that allows for your own group presentation preservation for your identitarian preservation. Otherwise, the relationship of justice is immediately a disaggregated, right? That also implies some regime stability, right? Uh, and here the credo inspires us, the inspiration I get from the credo is the law's distinction between well-governed and unwell-governed states, right? And so in the end, to wrap up, what does this mean, right? Well, it means first that not all refugee, if I'm right, and that there is really the, this obligation exists even in some cases of state that are non-democratic, illiberal, maybe even authoritarian, then not all refugee claims are equal. Um, it also, and more interestingly, it gives us intellectual tools to reassess and reevaluate the relationship of justice between non-authoritarian states and the constitutive communities that they treat in illiberal ways. Um, and the, those get goes back to the example that I mentioned uh, earlier, right? The groups who might be okay in relative terms, but are not so sometimes not so great in absolute terms or vice versa. And that's about it for me. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, I want to begin first by offering my congratulations to the RGCS, to the Lynn Center, and to McGill University for these milestone anniversaries. Um, I want to just thank Jacob and for all the organizers for allowing me to be here and to join in these celebrations. So I very much appreciate that. Um, the great constitutional historian, Charles Howard McElwain, once suggested that the history of constitutional thought can be narrated along one of two tracks. Now, one historical track, typically associated with the republicanism of Cicero, Machiavelli, and Madison, stresses the primacy of institutional design as the instrument to regulate and prevent the unlawful exercise of public authority by the strategic countervailing of powers. This is the track along which we seek to locate the origins of the separation of powers, the principle of collegiality, the mixed constitution, and federalism. The other track, which is associated with the liberal constitutionalism of Locke and Mill, stresses the rights of individuals as safeguards by burdening others, whether private citizens or public officials, with duties of non-interference which are guaranteed by due process of law litigated in the courts. Now, while these two tracks of constitutional thought are very often intertwined, they nevertheless represent two distinct histories that in my view deserve to be treated separately. Modern scholarship since McElwain's generation, which is almost now a century ago, has made great progress along the first track and its successes can be measured by how much the historical study of such institutional idioms have shaped other fields in law, public policy and the social sciences. And judging by some of the conversations from earlier today and other panels, we can already see the extent and scope of that influence. But there's much work left to do on that second track. That is the second track of rights. Now, one reason why I think this is the case is that the history of rights has often been narrated as an Anglo-American history, which relies on basis and bias of English common law concerning the function of rights. While this is hardly surprising, 
It makes the biggest difference when retracing the theory of rights in major textual sources, authored by Grotius, Pufendorf, Leibniz, Wolf, Montesquieu, Kant, etc., and etc., that are outside the common law world. While these academic lawyers made major contributions to what they regarded as the theory of rights, and therefore indirectly to the development of modern constitutionalism, their frame of reference and reasoning about rights derived not from Anglo-Saxon custom or common law, but from another legal tradition altogether, and that is the continental legal science of Roman and canon law, which collectively were often referred to as the science of right. If our goal was to trace this rights track, the second track that McElwain had once identified, it is essential to include this frame of continental legal reasoning. Now, the other point that I want to make is a chronological one. Rights are often seen to be the distinctive cultural product of Western modernity. As one commentator has suggested, rights are, quote, as modern as the internal combustion engine. Now, while recent theoretical and historical scholarship has made many advances and has actually complicated this conventional wisdom in various ways, most recently, and I think most notably in the work of Sam Moyne, academic political theory still operates along a timeline that views pre-modern societies, especially those of classical antiquity, largely as rightless civilizations. This is to say nothing of allegedly rightless civilizations outside the West. My message to you today is to say that you should be suspicious of those sorts of claims. As Kant once observed in his own science of right, where there are rules, especially rules or maxims that can be broken, there will be rights. Of course, they might not be called rights. They might not even be codified in the familiar form of a charter or a bill of rights. That will make this work much more difficult, but not impossible, though it will require rewriting, reimagining, and widening the cultural scope of the history of rights. So this paper that I'm offering to you today is an excerpt from, um, from one of the chapters in a book that I've just completed on Bodin's legal science. But it's one small contribution to that larger effort, and it focuses on the legal history that I know best, which is the history of Roman and canon law in constitutional thought. So this paper begins with a claim that I think is often taken for granted, um, and that's the claim that you know, rights are a product of modern, West, uh, of modern Western thought and Western practices. And so if it's a product of modernity, well, the major civilizations of classical antiquity could not possibly have had conception of legal rights. Needless to say, I, am, I really haven't been persuaded by that particular view, and I've had various ways of trying to figure out how one revisits that particular claim. And I think for a very simple reason, if you look at the legal culture, the traditions of the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Persians of antiquity, and above all, the legal culture of the Romans, these were all law-governed societies. And where there are laws that impose legal duties, there will by implication be rights. And for a simple reason, laws can be broken. And when laws are broken, there will always be a claim of trying to rectify or remedy when those wrongs have taken place. Where can we find evidence for this? Well, think about what happens when someone fails to perform a legal duty. And this is where I'd invite readers to take a look at this from the perspective of classical Roman law. How does a Roman lawyer answer these sort of questions? Suppose, take the following sort of examples. The debtor who defaults and fails to repay a loan he owes to his creditor. The seller who fails to deliver goods on time to a buyer. The tutor who embezzles from his ward's estate. Now it is a foundational rule of justice that one who has been wronged must get their due. They are entitled to get what is legally owed to them. And that is in fact, the way in which Roman law defines justice, use sum quique tribure the constant and perpetual will of giving to each his due. Now, that payment can be made either through money, through some equitable form of relief, or simply through a pound of flesh. Wrongs must be righted, and it is ultimately the duty of judges to provide that justice. But the means by which a court delivers justice was through legal remedies or through the form of lawsuits, which in the Latin of Roman law was classically designated as actio, uh, which is the Latin word where we get the modern English word action. Now actions were the court enforced vehicle, which took the form either of monetary damages or other equitable relief to enforce a litigant's claim of right. But it was clear that the stress was always on the remedy and not the claim of right that motivates that lawsuit. And I think the basic point that 
any Roman lawyer will tell us is that a right without a remedy isn't a right at all. You have to be able to sue. And that is why for classical jurists, finding the proper remedy or actio corresponding to a plaintiff's claim of right was the most important task for a court. Now, anybody who studied Roman law even minimally can appreciate this basic point. If you look at the very design of Justinian's digest and you open it up, what is the digest really? It's a menu, it's a catalog of actions. It's a catalog, a menu of legal remedies, but it's not supposed to be a menu of vague abstract rights. Open up the digest and you'll find lists upon lists of actionable remedies. And for a very practical purpose, if you were a practicing lawyer and you had a client who came to you who had some claim of right to pursue and to litigate, you'd naturally want to know what sort of action you're entitled to plead in court. And so it takes that practical form when you open up uh, the digest as well as the other uh, texts that make up Roman law. And for this reason, I think it's pretty fair to say that Roman rights talk really translates into Roman remedies talk. But suppose, however, that I have a claim to make, but there is no corresponding remedy to be found in the digest, no action to plead. Might it be possible to decouple such rights claims from the availability of re remedies? Now, there's several different answers. Now, the classical Roman answer is, well, no, there, there's no such thing as a right separable from a remedy. And so you're out of luck if that's the sort of claim that you're trying to make, because if you can't find it in the digest, there's no claim of right to make. Now we get a different answer when we go to the Middle Ages, because it's only in the high Middle Ages that lawyers seriously began to take the possibility of thinking about substantive legal rights separately from procedural legal remedies that are used by court to enforce those rights. So finally, it becomes intelligible to conceptualize rights without their concomitant remedies. This recognition, I think it's fair to say, marked a pivotal moment in Western legal history. And the reason for this is that it meant that there was no longer any need for a special section on the law of actions anymore, right? You don't need to think of the law as lists upon lists of remedies. You can simply talk about rights separately from what remedies that could be attached to enforce those rights. And you can even see this when you compare Roman law with something like the Napoleonic Code. If you open up the Civil Code of France, there is no separate section on actions. You just go right into a discussion of those rights. But this theoretical problem raised problems of its own, because suppose claims of rights now arise from non-performance of legal duties. Go back to some of our earlier examples, unpaid debts, undelivered goods, violations of faith in positions of trust. These legal duties are defined by specific legal rules or norms. Sometimes those legal rules are codified in the form of positive legislation, right? You can just go to some statute or some sort of law book or code book and kind of figure out what the legal rule is and what the associated remedies are. But you can't always do this because in the medieval legal mind, not all law comes from positive legislation. You have, in addition to positive legislation, you have natural law and an additional category of law that I think is less well known, but just as important for the medieval legal mind, the jus scantium or the law of nations. Both were seen as autonomous and valid legal systems coexisting alongside positive legislation and civil law. So natural law, the law of nations, as well as civil law, they were all made up of legal rules and their function, just like positive legislation, was to establish what is and what isn't obligatory, what is and isn't legally permissible. Now in the mind of the medieval lawyer, obligations derive from all three of these possible sources. You could have legal obligations coming from the natural law. You could have legal obligations coming from the law of nations, just as much as you can have obligations deriving from positive legislation. But here's the big difference. Even though you have obligations deriving from those three sources, the question about what sort of obligations are actionable is treated separately. Now, academic lawyers frequently distinguish by speaking of civil obligations, natural obligations and uscantium obligations, which correspond to those three different types of laws that these lawyers were accustomed to speaking of. But which of those action, uh, which of those obligations were enforceable? The standard answer in medieval legal science was only civil obligations. Natural obligations and uscantium obligations, while juridically valid, could never by themselves be regarded as enforceable. And for this reason alone, they were described as naked. They were naked obligations because they were stripped of actions to make them effective. 
Now, this is an old fashioned vocabulary that kind of falls out of fashion after the 15th century, but it comes back in a different form, beginning first with Grotius. And for those of you who may be familiar with modern natural law theory, you'll see the term imperfect rights and imperfect obligations. And that's the vocabulary that you see beginning with Pufendorf, Leibniz, Vattel, would use that language of imperfection because you can't complete them and because they couldn't be enforced by any ordinary court. Why aren't these naked obligations actionable? Well, we get the answer in one of the most famous glosses uh, in Roman law. And it lays out the basic principle that while you can have obligations that come from natural law and the law of nations, there are no actions that come from civil law. And that is because actions are only from civil law. What this means in effect is that you can sue someone for failing to perform a legal duty as defined by civil law, but you can't sue someone for failing to perform a natural legal duty or a legal duty that's defined under the Euskentium. Even more, you can't technically wrong or legally injure someone for failing to perform such naked duties. While it might be meritorious or super erogatory to do so, it is not actionable. Naked obligations thus present a major theoretical and interpretive problem for the medieval academic lawyer because of their asymmetrical structure. They give rise to duties, they don't give rise to rights, and they certainly don't give rise to actions. So I became interested in all this background because in recent years, and I think some of you know that I've been writing a book on Baudin, and, um, and one aspect of Baudin's legal science that puzzled me a bit and I wanted to get clear on was how does Baudin square his theory of sovereignty with this notion of legal obligations. Now, I think many of you may know that Baudin is the preeminent theorist of sovereignty in the history of modern political thought, but it seems to me that Baudin really struggled and tried to explain how sovereignty could nevertheless be seen to be legally limited. You know, how could you view sovereignty as being an absolute power and yet at the same time being regarded as some sort of a limited source of authority? And his answer, if you go back to the way that he uses many of these Roman and canon law sources, is that it's largely based on a critique of the traditional academic treatment of naked obligations as a potential source of legal rights. Now, Baudin is, of course, remembered for his analysis of sovereignty. Right? He defines sovereignty as absolute power. This didn't mean complete lawlessness. He insisted, and he insisted very clearly, that even sovereigns, like humans, like you and me, are all bound by legal rules of natural law and the law of nations, and that sovereigns could never excuse themselves from those obligations. So they have to perform those same duties in the same way that you and I do. But if these were naked obligations, how could they be enforced? And there we have the problem. You know, it's one thing to say that sovereigns have duties. It's another thing to say that you have rights that are enforceable against the sovereign. It turns out that Bodin, despite being a student of civil law and Roman law, actually didn't turn to the Gloucesters for his answer. And this is where, I, for me, and I guess for legal historians um, who work in this area, I actually found this pretty interesting because instead of turning to Roman law, I actually turned to canon law to find his answer. His answer in canon law actually comes from a set of texts that were written by the Decretalists. And two in particular play a very large role in his thinking, one by Huguccio and by Hostiensis. Now in canon law, it's observed that even natural law allowed for their own set of actions and remedies, and they were valid independent of positive legislation. Now, of course, in canon law, we're talking about the powers and authorities of the church. And so question is, under which jurisdiction can these remedies be applied? Bodin's answer, and this is just standard canon law reasoning, is that, well, you can only sue for this in the confessor's court of conscience. They are valid, as canonists put it, in foro interno, as the canonists put it. Bodin essentially adopted that canonist analysis, but he added one twist. Obligations arising from natural law and the Euskentium give rise also to their own unique set of remedies and rights, including what might be described as a procedural natural right to due process. But enforcement, and this is the important twist in Bodin, is that you don't have to go to your confessor to sue for these particular claims. You can do so in ordinary courts. Why? because courts, once they are created and constituted by the sovereign, they function as agents of equity. Even subjects then, the lowest subjects in a society could sue their own sovereign for enforcement of natural obligations that are due to them. Okay, so just to close, um, I spent 
a lot of time in this particular technical aspect of Baudin. And I, I was very interested in this because one thing I was very committed to showing in Baudin is that this person that I think so many people think of as this illiberal, hostile opponent of constitutionalism actually had a very robust theory of rights and belongs within this broader trajectory that I think has been forgotten. But I think there's a larger point to make. Bowden is seen as the opponent of constitutionalism, right? He's always seen as everything that constitutionalism should not be, right? So we should not find inspiration in Bowden. But actually what I find is that there's a lot of technical material here that actually explains later trajectories and later roots that explain the, the, the relationship between rights and the powers of state. And I think Bowden represents one of the major landmarks, I think, in that history if we're trying to rewrite it. So I think it's clear to me that this history needs to be revised. And I think I've done that in this book that I've just written. Um, and I think it shows how enforcement of naked obligations, binding sovereigns can actually translate into something familiar, something that might approximate what we today call civil rights or constitutional rights. But I wanna finish with one final thought because if we can do this for Baudin, right? We take someone who we think is someone who doesn't belong to this trajectory of constitutionalism, Who's next? Could there be someone else that we can bring in? Surely the history of constitutional thought can be so much more than simply the history of dead white men, as much as this may have been the comfort zone of academic constitutional theory. So who else will we find? What other names will we discover that have been overlooked, undervalued, silenced, and are invisible that might become part of this constitutional history and of this rewriting? I've been thinking a lot about this question recently. And I don't have a good answer at this stage, but I hope you'll agree with me that this is an important question to ask. And I'm glad to have a chance to talk with you. Thanks. Great, thank you very much. And thank you to all three of our paper givers. Um, I wanna start with a general comment about the work that's being done here. And then I'm going to have at least a little bit to say about each of the papers in turn, though unfortunately not a balanced amount. Uh, one thing that is, is I think worth noting is the degree to which these papers are in orbit around the status of the social contract as part of the core of the history of constitutional thought. Um, the Crito is of course, one of the earliest of texts to introduce something that looks like a consent theory of political duty and obligation that becomes a key animating part of the eventual contractarian metaphor. The idea of natural equality demanding the affirmative justification of artificial political institutions and of artificial rule that uh, is studied as the common terrain of the levelers and their opponents is also the terrain of the contractarian tradition which is one of the reasons why the levelers are, uh, are identified as being proto-contractarians or uh, early contributors to that cause. And the account of legal obligation that includes the obligation of contract as potentially binding and constraining even sovereign political actors is central to contractarianism as a form of constitutionalism. That is to say what we're hearing in Dan's paper that Baudin was committed to the idea that even a sovereign political actor could enter into a legally binding, genuinely obligatory contract. Um, that the sovereign was not absolute in the sense of absolute the ability to dissolve one's own affirmative contractual obligations. Uh, that's part of what makes contractarianism makes sense. And here as elsewhere, uh, Dan does a tremendous amount to help us understand the importation of juridical concepts like contract into early modern understandings of politics. And that merging of legal concepts and legal understanding into political foundations, that helps to generate constitutionalism as we come to encounter it in uh, in early modernity. Now, Teresa's uh, paper about the levelers is a piece of a larger project that she talked about and um, 
I, I'm going to not try very hard to pretend that I don't know the rest of that project uh, because I, I do and I like it a great deal. Um, but something that stands out about this piece on the levelers and 17th century England is the importance of the equality as balance idea that was, was an ancient and medieval inheritance that still carried over into early modernity. Uh, that equality means something like proportional balance is something that we know when we read Aristotle. But that that carries over long enough into history that when we encounter the idea of political equality in early modernity, we should still in our mind's ear hear something like the balanced constitution. That I think is a genuine surprise, something that comes out of the linguistic and historical work that Teresa is doing here. And it's one that helps extend our historical sense of the survival of the balanced constitution tradition into modernity. Now, one thing that seems worth noting about that to me for the post-levelers history is that that balanced constitution is of course a, an important part of early modern republicanism as well. While in the levelers debate, it might be primarily a rhetorical tool on behalf of uh, the royalists and the advocates of the House of Lords, both institutional balances among different, for example, uh, chambers of a bicameral legislature and restrictions on, or as we would encounter them restrictions, um, uh, imbalances in, as we would think of them, in political power, such as property restrictions on the franchise or unequally distributed uh, rights of representation in the legislature. Those are significant features of republicanism for a good long time after the era of the legislature, after the era of the levelers. And I think this work helps us to understand why that is. It's also going to help us understand things about the ways that uh, the Republican tradition, including, she notes, with the levelers and very much afterwards, uh, is able to naturalize certain kinds of inequality. For example, in gradually developing the idea that the natural equality of men makes peers of men in ways that can sharpen the degree of gender uh, hierarchy relative to women who are left out of this emerging peer group, even though their natural equality as indifference is respected. Uh, about Guillaume's paper, um, which I have double difficulty with, primarily because I don't understand the Greeks, but secondarily because, and I say this with all due affection, uh, the, the, the doctrine being promulgated is so deeply morally pernicious that I have trouble wrapping my head around it. Uh, this, this part two of the paper is carving out a limited exception to an idea that was developed in the accompanying part one of the paper. Uh, that is a doctrine of the residual obligation that emigrants have to their uh, originating political communities. Uh, and while I'm happy to nod along with the exception, I can't, can't really evaluate the quality of the exception because I have so much difficulty imaginatively enter into, entering into endorsing that baseline rule. Uh, but a few remarks about it, both with respect to Plato and with respect to the normative argument. With respect to Plato, the paper says that of, of the parent and slave or the, the parent-child relationship and the master-slave relationship analogies that are used in the law's discourse to Socrates. Only the parental argument is valid. Why is only the parental argument valid? Well, because slave masters aren't caretakers who uh, exercise their power by way of developing their subordinates toward independence. Now, this is, of course, naturally attractive to us as readers. But just to the degree that we are taking for granted in this paper, that emigration is prima facie suspect. 
that there is something naturally permanent about the citizenship obligation. Well, then that looks to me more like slavery than it does like childhood in just this sense. Citizenship is not teleologically oriented toward developing into becoming an emigre in the way that the parent-child relationship is teleologically oriented toward the child's eventual adulthood and liberation from the condition of subjection. While there are lingering duties of gratitude toward parents, there are not perpetual duties of obedience of the sort that the laws assert that Socrates will bear until he dies. Now there's, there's something hugely important about the slippage between slave and parent in the law's discourse to Socrates. But I don't yet know quite what it is, or I don't yet quite know what Guillaume thinks that it is. Um, this, the, the slavery part is so rapidly relegated to the dustbin of the argument. It's obviously wrong and therefore, to the degree that we find political communities that treat their subjects like slaves, we will waive the duty of emigrants to uphold their old communities. Um, I think that I need to hear more about what it is that Guillaume thinks is going on in the slippage between the slave and the child in Crito in order to know uh, how much credence to put on the abandonment of the slavery case. As a normative matter, I'll say that the, uh, the paper has an image of what it is like to try to improve the jurisdiction one has left that is very static. Um, the idea that departures can put competitive pressure on the abandoned jurisdiction to try to improve, to try to retain future potential emigrants is entirely absent. The act of departure is seen only as a potential source of undermining of the community being left. And this seems to be a case in which the shift to universalization, a shift that the laws make in addressing Socrates and a shift that Guillaume makes in turn, uh, is genuinely a mistake. It's the question, well, what would happen if everyone left? If everyone left, the society would collapse. Therefore, you have a prima facie duty not to leave. Well, no, if everyone left and transplanted themselves to some other spot in the world that was not under the local political dominion of the local rulers, then the community would disappear in its old location but might reconstitute itself in a better political circumstance. And in any case, the community's disappearance wouldn't harm anyone. What's being used is is a kind of marginal analysis without admitting it. If you leave and enough people who are similarly situated to you leave, then you will undermine the community that's left behind because most of us aren't leaving. That's not actually universalization, that's marginal analysis. And then it demands to be treated as marginal analysis, asking questions about how emigrants can and do act with respect to the communities that they leave behind? And the answer is sometimes they undermine its stability because they leave with their human and financial capital, but sometimes they improve it by putting competitive pressure on uh, the local government in order to try to retain future immigrants. Sometimes they improve it by engaging in long distance politics of the sort that is imagined here. Sometimes they harm it by engaging in long distance politics. There's a, a noteworthy phenomenon in the world of emigre extremism, where the emigres who don't have to live with the consequences of stirring up and radicalizing politics in their home community, for whom politics in their home community is just a matter of a badge of identity, become sources of votes, funding, political organization, and an offshore site for political movements that tend to radicalize and polarize the home community. Uh, if we're gonna get a marginal analysis of the relationship between migrants and their home community, then it's going to have to be more than just this sense that migrants uh, in a blameworthy fashion harm the stability of the community that they leave behind. <laughs>
I have very little to say in a critical voice of Dan's paper from which I learned a tremendous amount as I always do. Um, part of the difficulty is that this paper comforts me in prejudices that I already hold. First, that the subjective objective right distinction um, simply doesn't have the kind of importance that is routinely granted to it. And second, that uh, there's not a sharp distinction between the civil law and the common law when it comes to uh, the relationship between remedies and rights. One thing that I think uh, isn't mentioned here but could be is that the priority of remedies to rights is traditionally claimed as a feature of common law jurisprudence. And historians of the common law will just wrongly assert that the civil law, the Roman law, um, is obsessed with defining substantive rights. And it's a virtue of the common law that in its, pragmat in its pragmatic way, it prioritized writs and remedies over the definition of substantive rights until the mid 19th century. Um, the history that Dan is telling here just explodes that. Now, the, the account of Baudin, um, I am much more target of the rhetorical uh, and polemical moves being made here because I, I remain prejudiced in favor of the absolutist reading of Baudin, even though I've known for several years that Dan thinks that I'm wrong and I take that as good reason to suspect that I'm wrong. Um, but it remains the case that I read Baudin and see him trying to square circles. I see him trying to uh, import a sense of legal obligation that is binding on sovereign political actors at the same time that he's telling an institutional story in which enforceability is going to be tremendously difficult because the courts are in some meaningful sense decisively subordinates to the sovereign political actor as political institutions. And as uh, in his telling, the movement of the ob obligatory character of jus naturale and jus gentium moves from the confessor and the court of conscience into something like actual courts. Then the question of the power of a king over the actual judicial courts becomes central. And what we read from Bodan about politics and structures looks like it's still going to be problematically centralizing. Now, what I am persuaded by is that this tension, this problem, this attempt to square the circle makes Baudin a more central figure in the history of constitutionalism than has been widely recognized. Because after all, constitutionalism is itself a site that has been claimed as the nexus between natural law or natural rights and positive jurisprudence and positive political practice. That is to the degree that people think of constitutions as being where um, what used to be thought of as naked rights could be successfully vindicated against the positive law. Well, then that has been a consistent problem in constitutional thought for as long as that conception has governed because it is only real institutional political courts that do that work, that don't have privileged access, privileged epistemic access to the natural law either, and that are themselves subject to all the political pressures and institutional facts that constrain them as institutions of a really existing government. So it might be that what I'm seeing as a problem that Baudin does not successfully overcome is really to be understood as a problem that he is exemplary about that has continued to play constitutional thought from his time until now. Okay, um, any of the three of you wanna uh, offer any replies to any of that before we move on to questions? I think I'd like to hear the, the questions. Okay, uh, hearing no objections, we'll move on. Although I will say, Jacob, I think you're picking on the, you're picking on the Romanians. <laughs> Romanians on this panel. I, I was just informed by my friend that you were also and like I was completely <laughs> ignorant of that fact if I if I if I had known I would have made more like attempts <laughs> cross-cultural bonding so that we may have been allies in this um 
But uh, Jacob, yeah. just one thing though is- I, about emigre politics there too. Sorry, thank you. But uh, yeah, I'd love to hear the questions, but I do have something that I want to say to you, but I want in just the inter interest of time, I, I think it's great to leave the floor to people who have questions. Okay, uh, Turku. Actually, Arash was first, I was second. Oh, okay, sorry. When, since I was talking, I wasn't keeping careful track. Arash. Uh, I have a I have a question for uh, Daniel Lee. Daniel, um, thank you for that paper. I uh, basically this is the, the question is more um, uh, just trying to understand um, the argument that you were making at the beginning because not I don't have any expertise in this, but I want to understand. I want to figure out how I'm supposed to teach this to my students, basically. And so that, that's kind of what I want some guidance from you on. So you started out by saying, and, and Jacob kind of uh, applauded you on this by saying that, you know, you, 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 I guess complicating this story about objective right and subjective rights. And, and you were saying, look, you know, um, you're contesting this idea that there weren't, there wasn't a conception of individual rights in some way uh, prior to, um, uh, the late medieval period and so on. And so I thought, okay, well, uh, what, what is, the, how, is it, how are you gonna show this to us? And then what I understood you to be showing us um, by the end of it, I wasn't sure I quite understood why you started out that way. So let me put, uh, and I just, I, I know it's probably me not really understanding this. That's why I'm trying to figure out, ask you to clarify. So you ended up by saying that in the high middle ages, um, that's where you finally got this idea of uh, rights, legal rights that are separable from their remedies so that they, they could be thought of conceptually as distinct from and not analytically reducible to um, the remedies that you could seek in court through an action. And I thought that just is precisely what the new conception was supposed to be because I thought that the idea that there's no such thing as subjective rights independently of an objective order is precisely to say that whatever rights you have are just simply a function of the remedies that you can seek in a legal system through the courts of law. So that what you get now when we're talking about, well, there's a new, there's a conception of individual rights is that they're not analytically reducible to that. So I was, I guess I was just confused by, by the, what what just in my mind the contrast between how you ended that story and how you began it and I was just hoping you could clarify what exactly it is that you're contesting about the traditional story um, and how that's consistent with how you ended up. Uh, should I do it now or is that good? No, okay. Um, well, I think one one of my motivations for this chapter was some of the earlier literature on the history of rights. So if you go back all the way to Michel Vieille and some of the some of the sort of questions that Vieille and then the generation after that with what Richard Tuck and then Brian Tierney all try to do, is they try to they they try to explain uh, kind of a transition, you know, if you say that when we we used to think in terms of objective use, objective rights or objective law, however you want to think about it. But at some point there was some kind of transition that we started thinking about rights according to the subjective way of thinking about it, right? And, and that seems to be the way in which a lot of the scholarship of the past, maybe, you know, last generation or so, that's what they've tried to explain, you know? So when did we move from objective to subjective rights? Was it in the 13th century, the 14th century, the 15th century? Now, one thing, the point that I wanted to raise here is that, well, it's, it's an artificial distinction to say that, well, all of a sudden there was a transition from objective to subjective. You'll always find objective and subjective together, whether you're talking about classical law, whether you're talking about medieval jurisprudence or even today. And so I think that's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about a lot of the examples that you find not only in natural law, but also in civil law, even in the laws of California. If you, if you apply this kind of vocabulary, take any aspect of California, uh, California private law, you'll find an objective and a subjective aspect to it. And, um, and really what they're simply asking for is what are the rules that define what are the obligations and what are the rights that emerge from that? And what sort of remedies that try to address cases where, um, where duties have not been properly performed. So I think that was my original uh, motivation in, in looking at how Bowdoin belongs to this because um, 
you know, when you look at the history of rights, uh, often you'll see maybe Occam, maybe you'll see the Glossators, maybe you'll see the Dick Redists. And then finally, I'll have a jump, maybe you'll talk a little bit about Hobbes or maybe Locke. Um, and so, my, so I guess one big point was simply just to say that, look, the subjective and objective transition is the wrong way of thinking about it. And I think what we should be looking for is rather um, the different ways in which subjective rights um, uh, are, are expressed given the specific type of law that we're talking about. So that's why I said that we shouldn't just look at uh, natural law, but you'll find this also in the Uscantium and the Law of Nations, as well as you'll find it in civil law, positive legislation. Um, so I, just in short, that, that's, I guess just one comment I'd say. I think the, the other point is, um, or how do, you, how do you teach this material, right? I think, that's, I think that's sort of what you wanted to ask earlier on. And, and I think a lot of what motivated this for me was for someone like Baudin, he talks a lot about rights, you know, um, the legal rights of sovereigns, the legal rights of magistrates, the legal rights of even ordinary citizens. He has a very extensive vocabulary and a theory of what counts as legal rights. Um, they, they don't always, you can't always trace it back to positive legislation. So there's other background theory of what counts as valid, valid law that I think motivates a lot of his thinking. And so I think I wanted to kind of figure out, well, okay, what did someone like Baudin, who usually is thought of as an absolutist, what does he have to say about law that is valid, but doesn't need to be based on some theory of positive legislation or some sort of theory of legal positivism. Um, and so I think that's uh, that, that was my original motivation here. So I think large, I guess if you take a step back, I think what I wanted to do is kind of rewrite that earlier history. And I think um, I, just one final thing I would say is that I think there's a lot in medieval legal history that I think there's a lot of, there's, there's so much more interesting here that I wanted to kind of bring into studying someone like Baudin. Um, more than just simply saying Marsilius, more than simply just Barclays. Um, there's, there's another history that I think can be developed here, um, uh, as well as if we bring in canon law here. So I think those are some of my original motivations here. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Thanks. Um, so my comment is, uh, is uh, for Guillaume. Um, I, uh, I wanted to hear more about how something shaping our identity and the disclaimer is that I haven't read the paper. So maybe this is developed further in the paper, but I, I wanted to know more about how something shaping our identity generates um, an obligation um, to, um, you know, you, you, you refer to the state, you know, maybe we can broaden it a little bit and say, you know, to the, to the institutions or the community that is the source of that identity. Um, I mean, I see the argument in Crito. I think you're, you're right that the argument is in Crito. And I think you're also right that the argument is kind of in everyday discourse, we encounter it. Um, but I wonder how like that justification, that grounding works. And I, I so I was reminded of, you know, um, Robert Nozick has this cheeky example, right? If I, you know, if someone's playing <clears throat> or, you know, my neighborhood's running a radio station um, and, you know, um, and I like the music, I chuckle at the jokes, but then they tell me like for the price of having enjoyed the radio broadcast in my neighborhood, I have to contribute to the programming several days out of the year. And so he's kind of, the intuition he's testing is about reciprocity. Right. Um, so he, he's critiquing um, Hart's, Hart's theory of reciprocity there. But 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 the, but but I think it applies here because he's interrogating like the logic by which benefiting from something generates obligations. And I see that like identity and benefit are not the same thing. And in fact, like, um, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> Some of us spend time like actively running away from our identities um, that, that shaped us. Um, um, you know, this this is being recorded, so I'm gonna talk carefully here. And you like you might, you know, so so you know, you might think like why? Uh, why would one do that? You know, perhaps because you are a descendant of you know a, a genocide state um, or genocide deniers and so on and so forth. Um, um, but so in thinking about that example, like trying to test out that intuition, you know, that that you offered, um, I was thinking like, well, why? Right. So what sort of would that generate an obligation? And, and it occurred to me that like maybe 
a more kind of compelling or, or defensible um, way to make a similar argument, uh, you know, about identity and obligation might be to say um, that um, the injustices associated with that identity or, you know, what makes that identity one that like you might want to run away from, um, maybe you maybe the obligation is to try to kind of do something about those injustices right to to um you know um that define that identity that that shape it um um and um you know Again, I said that like benefit and identity are not the same because sometimes the identity confers burdens rather than benefits, but we often use identity as a sort of rough proxy for having benefited from something. So if you look at reparations debates here in the US, for example, um, that's, a, that's a sort of example about it, it, a way of thinking about it. So I wondered, um, I wondered if you might say a little bit more about um, how that justification works. Thank you. Um, so I'm glad that you asked these questions because I'm ready to answer them because the answers are in the paper that's already published. So I'm actually in a great position to say something about this as opposed to the half forms, sort of like the, the, um, the, the, like the half formed thoughts that are in the paper that are presented here. So regarding the relationship to identity and obligation, right? So here's what I think matters here. I think actually, that the way to think about this is in terms of um, of like freedom, right? Like, so when we think about the right to free movement, all right, like we think about it largely, and I'm thinking about Karen's uh, here, Joseph Karen's at University of Toronto, we think about it largely in terms of a right to self-determination, right? Like you don't just like, you move somewhere because you like it like better, for example, like, right, you go somewhere else, maybe you enter the culture better, maybe it's a climate, Thing, right like uh, for example right in Quebec it's like dreadfully cold like a lot of people move out right like go to the south go to like different places and when people and like a lot of the migration literature rests on this um, on the on the uh, the absolute right to free movement is like predicated on on this being a valuable aspect of, of like freedom right I think there's also an identitarian aspect to this like um, and I think that the self sort of like construction here is that you brought up is really important. Like you grow up, you become a certain kind of person, right? Like you, you decide there are certain things about yourself and your identity that you like and so on and so forth. And like, maybe you decide to, you decide no longer to, to be that. Right. And then, so, and when you, when you move as a result of this decision to no longer be part of a community of a certain culture of a certain things, right? Like we recognize this as a perfectly valid moral claim like in the case of the people who do like it like quite a bit right who enjoy this uh this identity who don't want to run from it or like or maybe they want to they, they go to like jacob said a little pocket of quebecers maybe in alabama or texas like where i studied and like now work right and they find their co-ethnicists and their quebecers but in the warmth which is a, a little bit different but it's a little bit of the like when this is expressed that way we understand this as sort of like uh like it's, we understand that to be a, a part of a, a right of self-determination in which we morally buy into. Uh, what I'm concerned about, what you said, the relationship of uh, whether or not benefit creates obligation. I think it does create obligation because like it's an intrinsic moral good. Like the things that you like about yourself, the framework, your ability to grow up in an environment where you can self-realize, where you can make those decisions about yourself, where you can self-determine. Like we understand the final product of this process as something that is worth preserving, that you have a right to keep, to fight for, but this process is not created in a vacuum, right? Like it's a, a participate, it's an edifice of work in which like many people have to contribute to in order for you to be able to do this, right? Um, and so, you know, like you can even, right? You grow up in a place where you can eventually turn around and say like, no, I don't want to be this, right? Like, I don't want to stay in Quebec, it's too cold. I don't want to embrace the Romanian half of my family and so on, right? This is made possible by a specific context, which is a very collaborative enterprise, right? When you leave a, a big place, a, a relatively healthy community, like for example, even Quebec or like, or Canada or, you know, like, or uh, 
you know, like white American society, you, I think that that moral act doesn't necessarily entail obligation because they're not threatened by your departure in terms of like identitarily. So like, I think that it, like Jacob was talking earlier about like, well, you know, so I think when you leave a big community like that, and this is something I developed in the first paper, that obligation doesn't quite exist because nobody is uh, really sort of like in danger, the community is not in danger of disaggregating if you leave. If you talk about small communities that are like really, 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 really vulnerable, like for example, uh, Native American communities in Quebec, right? Every act of departure is like a critical, uh, is like a, and I think that the, the obligation that is generated actually is not towards the state. And this is something I elaborate in the first paper. It's generated towards the community. And so the corrective that I propose in the first paper is to give the option for the expatriate to maintain some sort of like local expatriate voting rights in order to be able to offset the lot of political, the political agency that is created by their departure. I call that the sort of like the lack, the loss of human capital. Like, and I think that part of the ways in which my argument is, uh, seems like difficult to buy for a lot of people is that like, I do think that this identitarian obligation is created at the community level not at the state level. I don't think that our obligations is toward the state of Quebec or the state of Canada. I think they're towards the people whose identitarian self-determination might really be like, might truly be like the, um, threatened by our departure. And in fact, if, you're, if your act of departure is one of, if you're fleeing, right, you can choose not to exercise that right. You can say like, well, no, I'm deciding not to vote. I'm not going to vote in my local elections. I'm not going to do this. Right. And so it, it sort of like maintains here this duality where we don't we don't end up in a problematic place, I think, or at least I try to avoid a problematic place that exists at this juncture of uh, of obligation and benefit. Uh, does that answer your question? Um, somewhat, but I don't, I don't want to take up too much time, okay. but I, I was hoping you might kind of talk a little bit about what happens when the identity is like doesn't have that positive yeah. connotation. So when the identity like, doesn't have and actively just, just, just destructive. Oh yeah. The um, 